For thousands of years, so much of mantras have been chanted in this land. There is so much of energy here. That's why in India, people don't feel so much like going to the beach. Did the deities come first or the mantras? The thing is, the mantra is the deity. It is the energy. You begin to open yourself up to mantras like Om Namah Shivaya. And you won't believe, just people who have never done anything with any of this. You make them chant Om Namah Shivaya 108 times with the eyes closed. People come up and share such profound experiences. Internally, when mantras become a part of your breath, they say you start looking like the deity, but what they're truly trying to say is that you're gradually becoming the deity, very gradually. How do you explain this? Each mantra has its own specific quality, like we spoke about, the Devata is the mantra. Like you said, those qualities will start manifesting more and more in you. For example, I think there was a saint at some point, he was such a devotee of the mother. At some point, he, he got breasts. So if that is possible, then for the mind and the emotions, definitely. There's a reason that spiritual seekers from all over the world choose to travel within India for their own spiritual answers. One such spiritual seeker who's reached an advanced stage is our guest for today, the Dutch monk Swami Poon Chaitanya. Today's episode is deeply therapeutic. It's a deep dive into the subject that we know of as Shiva. And it's one of those episodes that you'll remember as one of the iconic TRS episodes. So if you're someone who enjoys our spiritual genre of episodes, this one is special. It's Swami Poon Chaitanya speaking to me about my favorite topic within the realms of spiritualism. It's all about Shiva today on TRS. <music> Swami Poorna Chaitanya, welcome to TRS. Pleasure to be here. Uh, are you ready for me to trauma dump on you? <laughs> we'll learn. Only one way to find out. <laughs> Whenever these spiritual podcasts visit my life, uh, I usually need them to visit my life at that point. Uh, and I take something away from it. So I welcome conversations like this into my existence. Firstly, thank you for being in my house. Thank you for being in front of me. Thank you for your presence. It's a pleasure. How are you, sir? I'm great. I mean, I feel great. Uh, I have a lot of questions for you. Bring it on. It's a lot of personal questions. Uh, but maybe just so that the audience gets a little context, I'd love to know your Dutch name as well. I'd love to know about your story. Uh, I'd love to know how you're 25% Punjabi. <laughs> <laughs> so just break that down for the audiences before we dive deep into sure. this spiritual conversation. So... I was born and brought up in the Netherlands, uh, in a place called, mostly in a place called Harlem, which is near Amsterdam. Um, my mother was half Indian. So her father was from India. She was born in Delhi and he was originally from Punjab. He came uh, when the partition happened, when Pakistan became separate from India. He, with his brothers and sisters and his mother, came all the way to Delhi, uh, built a life for them there. And at some point he got this interesting idea to come to the Netherlands for some time to learn how to make dairy products like cheese and, and baby food. Uh, and that is where he met my grandmother uh, in a train. <laughs> Somehow they, they got connected. Long story short, at some point they got married. She came to India with him. Uh, my mother and her brother were born there. But then when she was young, she came back to Netherlands with her mother. So she grew up there in the Netherlands mostly. She didn't speak any Hindi or, or things like that. But uh, that makes her half Indian. And then when I was born, that makes me 25% because <laughs> my dad was definitely Dutch. Um, and then the name they gave me was Alexander. So that is the name I've used a uh, big part of my life. Um, how do you explain to your friends in the West about what you do now? Or more specifically, how do you explain Sanatan Dharma, Hinduism, Shiva, these concepts, mantras, to your friends back home. Have you ever tried? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm nowadays, I mean, I've spent the last two years more in Europe and I've actually done like uh, big tours like Netherlands, UK, Denmark, Germany, so many places where I even conducted master classes on say mantras or uh, secrets of karma, uh, all these kind of topics. Um, imagine I'm someone who's born and raised in Europe yeah. and I've never heard of these things. How do you explain all these things to me? Because my only perception 
of God is what I have heard since childhood. I've never even heard of Shiva, hypothetically speaking. Because the thing is, when you grow up in India, you take these things for granted. Oh yeah, Shiva. Oh yeah, Vishnu. Oh yeah, Mantras. Yeah, yeah. we know what that is. That's because you're born in this culture. What about the people outside? How do you explain the 101 of this? So, for example, when you talk about Shiva or any Devata, how I introduce it, that I say that, I told, tell them a little bit about the Rishis, you know, that in, in India, ancient times, they had sages, saints, who went into a deep state of meditation where their intuition became so clear that by taking their attention to something, the knowledge of that would unfold itself. And then I tell them, of course, this sounds a little abstract, but to give an example, you know, we have these scriptures on astrology, astronomy, Ayurveda, so much, where we have practical knowledge, where, for example, they spoke about the different moons of Saturn, even though our modern telescopes have only been able to physically confirm or perceive that in the last few decades. But then they realized that whatever was written in these scriptures is spot on, it's correct. They spoke about the world being round thousands of years ago. No, Bhugol. Even if you see some of these statues and, and, and descriptions where the Varaha Avatar, you know, where Vishnu lifted the earth from the waters, they say earth was round. And in the West, they only found out a few hundred years ago when you keep sailing and you don't fall off. <laughs> you know, I mean, it sounds very bad to put it like that, but to put it bluntly. So they had this knowledge of Ayurveda, of so many things, but that knowledge was downloaded, you can say, from, from a, the universal consciousness or from, it was intuitive knowledge. And so I said that they had this knowledge of how to go deep into meditation, to clear their mind to such an extent that they were able to tap into that. And then when we talk about mantras and devatas, I said there are so many different types of mantras. The knowledge of mantras also came from, from the rishis. And to such an extent that the definition of the word rishi is a mantra drashta. You know, it's one who has seen the mantra, who has perceived the mantra. It's not a mantra karta, it's not the one who has created it. So, like how we had, uh, you know, people know this story maybe from school, Newton, you know, and the law of gravity where he was sitting under a tree, one apple fell and he figured out. So, Newton did not see something fall for the first time. Things keep falling all the time, even apples. He would have seen it so many times. But at that moment, if the story is true as it is told, he was sitting under the tree, he was chilling, he was very peaceful. He saw one apple fall down. And at that moment, his mind, his intuition was so clear that he did not just see the apple fall. He also saw that there is a principle behind it that is causing this apple to fall. And then he was able to work it out as what we now know as the law of gravity in physics. And because he was able to do that, now any of us can, can use that and people are using it. So in the sa similar way, not exactly same, you could say that he was the Rishi of the law of gravity because he didn't create gravity. He didn't invent it, but he was able to perceive it so clearly and then share it in such a way that we can use it. Now, of course, in the, in the Vedic scriptures also, they talk about gravity and all that already. That's a different thing. But the point is that the rishis were able to perceive these mantras in that state of meditation where they say, okay, these sounds have this kind of impact, definite specific impact on our body, on our mind, on the environment. And they shared that. And the beauty is that they said, okay, there is one universal consciousness or one substratum of this creation, but there are all kinds of vibrations. Now, if you look at string theory also, it's, it's vibration, it's energy that is vibrating in so many ways. So these natural forces or these universal cosmic energies, they call it devatas. So they say a mantra invokes a certain energy or resonates with a certain frequency and they call it a devata. And then you can have Ganesha or you can have uh, Shiva or there are so many. And then usually I explain a little bit about Ganesha, for example, that, you know, at some point they started depicting these devatas because it became a little difficult for people to relate to something as abstract as a cosmic energy. You know? In the ancient days, they had yagyashalas. They used to worship with mantras. They didn't have all the murtis and everything yet. The temples, the mandirs, as we see it now in those days, it was not the same. The rishis had yagyashalas. But then at some point for people, it became very abstract, not just a mantra. So... They said, okay, how to make a visual depiction of what this energy does? So if we say Ganesha, elephant head, well, one of the reasons is because it gives you that knowledge, awareness, that full awareness, all this knowledge. So to put all that knowledge and awareness, you need a very big head. Otherwise, it doesn't fit. 
Now, what's the biggest head you could find? Okay, elephant. No, there's no animal that was walking. Dinosaurs were gone already. So what has the biggest head? Okay, elephant. And there are many things, like it has a trunk, right? Ganesha has a, an elephant head has a trunk. And that has two functions. It's a karmaendriya. It is something with which you can grasp, you can act, organ of action. It's also a jnanaendriya. It's something with which you can perceive, you can gain knowledge. So where action and knowledge come together, move together, that is one of the things that Ganesha symbolizes. Because if you want to prevent obstacles or problems, or you want to resolve them, solve them, you need to have the right knowledge of what is the problem, what is the solution, but you also need to act. Because there are many people who know how things should be. They can keep complaining, government should do this, people should do that, but sitting at home and having all this knowledge is no good if you don't act. And some people will be very active, but if they don't have the right knowledge how to go about it, you can, you know, overthrow a dictator, but if there's no plan B, you get chaos, no? The situation becomes worse. So then you can explain to people that, okay, for example, if we make it very simple, Ganesha or Ganapati is that energy or is the mantra that kindles this quality in you where you get that broader understanding, the knowledge, as well as the right action to overcome your problems or to prevent them. So we've just touched upon a few things, but that way I explained that, you know, they had a beautiful way to depict it. So all these descriptions, and you've had podcasts with people who've spoken about it in detail, how even different forms of Ganapati, for example, represent specific aspects, whether he is standing, sitting, lying down, you have a Shakti Ganapati and so many things. And each of them is like a, a visual, you can say, user manual for those specific mantras that those have been at least taught a little bit about these things. Just by seeing that description or hearing the description, then, oh, he's, he's holding this kind of weapon or he's sitting on this kind of Vahana vehicle or he's having this kind of dress. They know exactly, okay, so this mantra can be used for this and this and this. This is what it will do. Did the deities come first or the mantras? So the thing is, the mantra is the deity. It is the energy. And the forms is what, what was revealed to the rishis. That's how they uh, depicted it. But basically, because they say the devatas, they have a mantra sharira. Their body is the mantra. And... In the Vedas, there is a nice story also where at some point they cover themselves with chandas, with the, the, the rhythm for the Vedic mantras, the intonation, because they wanted to hide from, from death. But then death is very smart. But the point there is that if you don't know the proper intonation, pronunciation, you cannot, you cannot see the devata. No? That, that makes it complete. So the mantra, yes, the pronunciation has to be proper. The intonation has to be proper. Then you get access to those energies. But then in the West, I tell people, so there are these different energies and we can use it for different purposes. And the beauty is that then usually one of the mantras that I feel is both very accessible and at the same time, which is very potent, is Om Namah Shivaya. So I explain to them some of the benefits of the mantra, how they can chant it. And then we chant together 108 times. I actually make them do that. And then... Can you talk about the mantra? Yeah. And then, but then they get the experience. You no, know, it's amazing. So... What I usually explain to them is that, okay, why this mantra is so useful? And I go a little bit into Ayurveda, into Jyotish, into Vastu Shastra, because Na, Ma, Shi, Va, Ya. These five sounds are connected to the five aspects of Shiva that are known as the Pancha Brahma, his five faces. And these five forms of Shiva, they are called Sadyojata, Vamadeva, Aghora, Tatpurusha, and Ishana. Now, each of these aspects of Lord Shiva governs one of the elements, the Pancha Mahabhuta, that this creation is made up of. So I tell them that from the Vedic perspective, one way to look at this creation is that it is made up of these five elements in subtle form, combinations, permutations, including our body and mind. And these forms of Shiva are the Adishtata, the ones that rule it. So through this mantra, what we do, we invoke these different aspects of Shiva, their blessing, to who govern these elements to balance it. And we add Om. Om is the sound of creation, the, the vibration of consciousness itself. So then you align those five elements with consciousness. It brings a harmony. <laughs> so there is something, you know, about this. And like, I mean, there are many things, <laughs> but that has made me fall so much in love. Not just that, also that part, that part recognition, but this this ancient knowledge and this wisdom, you know, whether we call it Sanatana Dharma or the Vedic tradition, or it 
it has so much power and I've seen that also when you want to learn these things, because there may be many people who, who are keen to learn, many are seeking, I've seen whether it is Jyotish astrology, whether it is Ayurveda, whether it is knowledge of yoga, of Vedanta, Upanishads or anything. If you have a proper teacher like a guru, an acharya, and you have a parampara, you know, the tradition, that again takes it to a very different level. Because I've seen that this knowledge is so vast that one, you can get, you need all the help you can get. But when there is a blessing of a parampara behind it, you no, know, when the guru is there or a lineage of gurus is there, that will carry you. And I've seen because I meet so many people and sometimes they ask me, we have a conversation. You know, how in, in such few years you have learned so many things? No, many things, even I don't know how, where it came from. You know, like you said, something will open up. Or, But I've seen that when that parampara is there behind it, that really makes a difference. And if you see the scriptures everywhere, they say the same thing. Learn this from a guru. Learn this from a teacher. Because they've only put some of the things. They don't put all the things. Some things you have to get through that. But it's not just the knowledge. It's the consciousness behind it that works. When someone is giving you the knowledge from their own experience, then it hits a very different chord. So, yeah. Um, I've spoken about this on the show earlier, but the first time I sat for an Om chanting meditation. Okay. So when you say the word, um, it has an impact on the environment, but it especially has an impact on your own body, on your mind, your throat box your voice box, your soul. Eventually, and this is very Indian urban perspective, you begin to open yourself up to mantras like Om Namah Shivaya. Hmm. Now imagine if saying Om loudly has this kind of an impact on the environment. If you're saying it silently, what kind of impact is it having on your internal environment? That's something you figure only through experience. Which is why, again, if you try finding the limitation in mantras, uh, you'll become the limitation yourself. Mm. Just flow with it. Execute, experience it, and then come to your own conclusions. Um, but Om, you know, there is something interesting about Om. Because, especially when we talk about the Om Namah Shivaya, like this, the, the Panchakshi Namah Shivaya, this is actually, this is the, what known as the Panchakshari. You know, it is a mantra with five aksharas. And then usually we add Om to it. But then Om itself is called the Sukshma Panchakshri. It also has five parts. So from Shiva, Lord Shiva, it said first Om came. He came, That it's one of his forms, he did the, that pure vibration, that pure consciousness. So you have the A, U, the Ma sound, and then there is the Nada and the Bindu. This is a bit technical for people, but there's five parts to it. But then they say that if you do the Japa of Om, especially the mental Japa, this is actually only recommended for people who are really ready to leave everything, including their body. So they say for anybody who is living, the mental japa of Om, two, three times is okay. But like proper japa, it's actually not recommended. They say you do Om Namah Shivaya. Because that, they say it's it will cut everything. So not just your worldly stuff, but everything, your body. And, and the thing is, you still need to eat, no? And I'm sure you want to eat at least something. <laughs> so, so it's interesting, it, but it also shows how powerful, you know, how powerful. I'm going to frame this question in a particular way, but obviously I'm asking you something deeper. Why is it that sometimes when you look at someone, you know that that person is a Shiva worshiper? There's a commonality. And I see this with a lot of Shiva worshippers recognizing each other. And it's a stark difference from when you meet someone who worships Krishna. Both are positive, mm. both are positive in very different ways. Yeah. But at least with Shiva worship was like the moment I saw you outside, I was like, ah, he's like me. <laughs> <laughs> a little sense of detachment. Mm. When I see a Krishna worshiper, they bring a lot of freshness and bliss mm. with them. And I love being in their freshness and bliss. But with Shiva worshippers, there's a sense of mutual detachment from each other, from... Sansar in general, the environment. I do believe that when you chant mantras internally, when mantras become a part of your breath, they say you start looking like the deity. But what they're truly trying to say is that you're gradually, very Those slowly. Qualities, yeah. yeah, You're becoming the deity very gradually. How do you explain this to the West? 
like you may be very successful now at some point you'll die at some point people will forget again you know so it doesn't mean you don't make a difference but if you look from a bigger perspective even this whole planet is a particle of dust you know we are really not that important we think we're very important but just like there are so many people crawling on this planet you have so many bacteria in you they die every day they get born again they may think they're very important but we don't even know they're there so shiva has that kind of detachment now a krishna bhakt he will have a different flavor you know a devi bhakt again will have a different flavor and there are stories you may have come across those as well of saints and sages uh, in this country probably other parts of the world as well who had such a strong devotion to one of the devatas that even physically their body started reflecting some of those qualities like you know where their body started even growing into that uh, that form where they started looking like for example i think there was a saint at some point he was such a devotee of the mother at some point he he got breasts you know like it just Ra- it, ram krishna paramans yeah i mean there are a few examples but the same way there are such stories where you can see that that when it becomes so strong so if that is possible then for the mind and the emotions definitely you know so to them i explain it like that 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 frequency becomes and and somewhere it's not so difficult to imagine because if you talk about you know you have people around you who talk about uh, investing all the day all the time even if you never talk thought about invest suddenly you may feel oh i should get some shares or if you have people talk about cricket all day long you will start thinking about cricket even though you never <laughs> thought anything about it yeah. that's why sangha is important also i don't i don't think the world is in the best place both mentally nor uh materially by by material i don't mean just money i mean material mm-hmm. reality is not in the best place when it comes to the world so i hope that people find healing through conversations like this but it's just a hope right now you know it's a it's a time of transformation and like we spoke no transformation is never easy change always comes with some pain um i remember about 10 years back uh, my master gurudev shri shri vishankar once when someone asked him about you know maybe even more 15 years or 20 years that they said no 2012 they were expecting this big <laughs> shift of spirituality and and then once he actually spoke about it he said you know don't think that suddenly one day people will wake up and become spiritual he said what is actually going to happen is you will see there will be more natural calamities there will be other conflicts economically for some parts of the world will be very difficult so he said basically what is happening is that all those things that people tend to rely on for their sense of security and stability will start shaking and then when those things go people will need to have something else to hold on to and that's why even that time he told he said no we need to do whatever we can to share this knowledge to be there for people because if nobody is there to catch them people will fall and you see that now with pandemic it was very obvious people suddenly who thought that i'll never lose my job i've been working there for decades were let off people who had a successful company may had to shut down people who thought they're very healthy suddenly got scared saying even as a young fit person i may get this crazy as what if i die or you may lose someone dear to you there were so many things that started shaking and i think that greatly contributed also to what we see now that people realize that you know there there has to be something more or or they're waking up and they're like whatever i was doing this is not everything because you've spent so much time in indian villages and indian metros i'm sure you have an idea of what it's like growing up in india just based on what you've seen or at least the mindset you've seen mm-hmm. around you so i want to ask you about what it's like growing up in india according to you versus what it's like growing up in europe what's the difference there's a lot of differences there but what i've seen in india is that still in many places to a small or larger extent this ancient tradition you know whether we call it the sanatana dharma or the local culture or whatever you want to call it it's alive and it it may be decreasing uh, in some places in the sense that decreasing to the extent that people are exposed to it they have access to it but it's there and in the west like for example in the netherlands we don't really have that anymore you know so many places in europe now some people are trying to get it back or it's an attempt to to reconnect with it you know whether it was the the scandinavian countries where they're reconnecting maybe to the the whole uh, viking traditions and things like that but in europe most of these places that it's not a continuous link you know because at some point we had different tribes there you had we had our own 
uh, nature uh, worship or the different uh, traditions, belief systems, some of them very ancient. But then at some point, you know, there was the, the Roman Empire that invaded. Then, of course, the, the Christianity came, the churches, a lot of the local customs were discontinued or discouraged. So we don't have that living tradition like that. People, some people are trying to reconnect to it now because those are our roots, you could say. But here it's alive. You know? it's, it's probably the, the most ancient civilization or, or tradition that has continued. Do you feel that in Europe there is a lack of that feeling of ancientness? What you spoke about, the link being broken. Do you feel like young people on a subconscious level feel that? Because... Um, the narrative that we get about the West in general, which is Europe and America, yeah. while we're sitting here as Indians, is that mental health issues are on a rise there. And then I have some European friends who have spoken about this too. A lot of them believe that maybe because people have kind of stopped having faith in religion or a sense of God, atheism has kicked in in a big way. That could be a reason. I don't know. I've, I'm not European. I've not grown up in Europe. In fact, I don't even know the reality of modern day Europe because vacationing is one thing, yeah. but when you live, then you grow up, that's a whole other experience. So what's the reality of Europe now from uh, a mental health, emotional health and spiritual health standpoint? Well, all over the world, mental health and emotional health are, uh, are a challenge now, even in India, but there even more, definitely. And I think one of the factors is one, culturally, that people are more and more isolated, I would say. You know, it's very individualized. Like, of course, even here nowadays, not everybody has an extended family where you all live in the same house and like it used to be. But still, the connections are much stronger here. You know, you, the, you're not just an island by yourself. It's community living. Yeah, it's, it's much stronger. So there, that is much less. So it's not that people don't meet, but you, you live by yourself. You know, even when you go to college, you move out. And then normally, you don't move back in. So whether it's 18, 19, 20 years, then you say bye. You may visit your parents once a week or once in a while, but, you know, that's kind of it. And then obviously when, you know, you're more thrown back onto yourself, then it depends also, okay, how do you, how, how much do you go out and meet people? How much do you interact? But also the spiritual aspect or the religious aspect, uh, it may differ a little from country to country. But for example, in the Netherlands, I think hardly anybody is really religious in the sense like if you say in my when I was in high school how many of the people in my class of 30 people would go to church even once in a while maybe one really and that was because their parents would take them you know and they're not interested so churches for example are empty but what's the sense of God then so the thing is it's not that people are like total atheist or you know they just want to you know like uh, have food make merry and that's it but I would say that is a definitely a, a large growing sense of you can say spirituality so it's not that people are not exploring but there definitely has become a, you know, there's a bit of a vacuum or that people are aware of they're trying to fill it's just that that the old ways of religion whatever was there cannot cater to it anymore because they feel okay even if some guy is talking something there he doesn't have an experience you know if i want to read some book whether it's a scripture or something else i can do that at home you know so why would I go and sit there? So that disconnect is there. Like, it's not the same, but here, for example, sometimes even, you know, like youth come to me and they have an interest. They want, they have the big questions, actually more maybe than even before. So they want to know, okay, who am I? You know, what is all this? Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? What is this creation? But then if their parents or grandparents will tell them, come, you have to come to the mandir. And then if they ask, okay, but then what is the point? Why should I break one coconut? Now, if their family cannot give satisfactory answers, it's natural for them to say, then, no? why should I do that? I will explore in my own way, you know, because I want to know. So there also, if you see whether it is yoga, whether it's meditation, whether it's ayahuasca, or whether it is, you know, people doing some program on mindfulness, or they want to learn more about chakras or Buddhism, or like there is a lot of interest. And with pandemic, that spiked even more, you know. So many people, they are asking these questions. They want to know. They want to know, okay, who am I or what is this? Or I'm not just this body or maybe not even just these thoughts and these emotions. So that's very strong. But 
yeah, from a religion perspective, that is not really being catered to. Maybe different geographies have different impacts on your thought process. That's one thing I truly believe. I feel like if you're in this land called India, like this subcontinent, your head automatically trails to deeper thoughts like the universe or God. And a lot of Indians don't understand that until they actually go abroad and understand the difference between energies of lands. Definitely. See, a place has its own energy and vibration, whether you take a local place or, or an entire country. And I know so many people from not just from Europe, from other parts of the world who have uh, shared this with me or, or agree with me when I said that, you know, you can say, okay, when you come to Delhi, maybe the air is not as fresh as it may be in Switzerland. You know, there will be some pollution. It may be more noisy. I mean, it will be no more noisy. You know, <laughs> sometimes it may not be as clean or as organized, but still the moment you get off the plane and you come there on a subtle level, something feels so much lighter, you know? So that subtle air or, or environment or space, whatever you want to call it, is so much lighter, like you said. And the thing is, uh, I remember once someone asked my master about, uh, you know, something around this topic. And he said, you know, because for thousands of years, so much of mantras have been chanted in this land. And, you know, you've had the rishis and everything that even today, on the subtle level, there is so much of energy here. And he said, that's why in India, people don't feel so much like going to the beach. Because if you see abroad, people love going to the beach. Why? Because that salty water, no, on a subtle level, it clears your, it clears your aura, it clears your, your mind. So you feel lighter. You know, people go to the sea to feel lighter. But here, because that energy is so strong everywhere, you don't feel a need to go to the sea, especially. Here you can sit, you can sit in any, whether it's a local temple or maybe even your terrace. And of course, when you go to special places, like, you know, whether it's a Jyotirlinga or an ashram or, you know, a place where that energy is even stronger, you just sit there and you don't even have to do something special. Even if you say, I don't know how to meditate. No problem. You just go and sit there. That place will have an impact. You know? Like we spoke about that, are there different things that impact our mind? Are the quality of your thoughts? One of them is the place. So a good place will have a very positive impact. The message I keep trying to put out through this podcast, this podcast was started from a place of a lot of love. Every single episode uh, intends on packing healing and then sending it out to the world. So there's a lot of good intention, which is why I think this room feels happy nice. and nice. Um, but, you know, there's a part of me that's like really, I'd say it's like fallen out of love mm. with not just podcasting, not just my career or materialism, mm -hmm. but with life. I don't know why. And I don't even think it's a bad thing. I think I'm getting deeply detached. I've not felt this detached in my life ever. Mm -hmm. I've just submitted to God now. And I'm focusing a lot on my practice. That's it. Then letting God like act through me. My only prayer to God often at night is do your work in this world through me. That's it. Um, but this sense of detachment is also causing some pain on the inside. I don't it even know to. why. It has to. Because for any change to happen, any change, you know, we have to let go of something. And that is always painful, you know. Even if it's something that is not good for us, still to let it go for our mind, it is painful. You know, you see, you sometimes you see old people that have lived in a house for, say, 50 years, and now the place is, it's a dump, you know, it's leaking. There's so many problems, but they don't want to move. You tell them like maybe, you know, your parents or some, like someone will tell their parents that come, I got a nice other place for you, or at least that till we fix this up, but they don't want to, because that's what they know. So like you said, sometimes we go through phases in life where we may, you know, accumulate uh, habits that are not good for us or, or people around us that are not good for us or it could be anything or even just mental conditioning that's not good for us. Mental conditioning that's not good for us. But because we know it, to let go will be painful. You know, people, some people can, it sounds very strange, but you can get used to and even start liking being depressed or, or being angry or being so frustrated Enjoying the wounds, not letting the wounds heal. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's a kind of enjoying. It's not real joy. So what you're saying makes total sense. And if you, like one of the most beautiful scriptures I have read multiple times, which is the Yoga Vasishta, there it starts with Lord Rama 
coming to this point where he he got these realizations where he said, okay, you know, as a prince, he's experienced so many things. This is before he got married and all of that. But then he comes to a point where he becomes so dejected because it's like, what is the point? You know, all of this, it's temporary. Even these pleasures are temporary. Then I'm back to square one. So this is not going anywhere. So it is that point where you start seeing the impermanence or the futility of what you know as the pleasures or the goals that you're supposed to strive for and all of that. But you've not yet come to the point where you can fully consciously experience that joy and fullness of consciousness itself, of the self. And then Vasishta, the, the guru of the family, he comes and he starts giving him the knowledge of the self. So if you haven't studied it, it's something that you must read. I can recommend a good, uh, very beautiful translation. But it's so beautiful to see how step by step he takes him to the point that, okay, what is the nature of the mind? What is the nature of the self? You know, how are they different? And then this whole world, how to make sense of this duality because it's, it's relative. It's not absolute. But at the same time, we are experiencing it. So how do you bridge this uh, supposed gap or apparent gap between duality and non-duality? It's duality very tricky. and non-duality. What is the duality in the first place? Well, everything here, what you see, if you feel that I am separate from this or mm. that, is, that is not just me, that is duality. That means there's two or more than two. You and something else. And non-duality is that it is in the end, it's all one. So Adi Shankaracharya, the Advaita Vedanta, Advaita means the non-duality. So where he said that uh, Brahma Satya Jagan Mitya, Jivo Brahmaiva Napara, which means that this whole world that we see appears, but is not really. And what is really permanent, what is truth is Brahman. It's one consciousness, one universal consciousness. And the jiva, the individual consciousness, the self and the universal consciousness are actually not separate. So he explains it very beautifully saying that, say, you go out at night and, you know, you go down a path and then you think there's a snake. Now you get scared because you know, what if the snake bites you? So you stop, you have a small lamp with you. You think, okay, let me wait for the snake to leave first. But then your heart is beating and you're very scared and oh, what will happen? Will I be okay? And then suddenly from behind someone else comes and uh, say your sister comes with a bigger lantern. And the moment she comes closer because the light is more, you realize, oh, it's not a snake, it's a rope. So there was a rope lying there, someone would have left it, but it looked like a snake because the light was less. The moment you see it's a rope, that fear is gone, everything is fine. <sighs> Thank God, you know. So he says this world, this whole whatever we experience, including your body and your mind and your limited identity, it's like that snake. It, you think it's there, but it's not really there. But then you cannot say that, oh, there was nothing there. No, there was a rope that made you think it was a snake. The same way he says, it's not that there is nothing. No, there is consciousness. But we experience it as being different in so many ways. And this is a, a topic for lifetimes, you can say, because all the, the great masters and saints have spoken about it in different ways. But the more you start experiencing that, yes, on one level, really, this is all, it's all one. You know, whether it is all me or whether it's all him, or it's all the, the Shakti or whatever. No? Different people approach it in different ways, how you connect. But in the end, that it is one thing. And then the beauty is, the more that comes in, then you start also being able to appreciate everything as a form of that. Like I was in Rishikesh a few days back. I had brought one group from Europe. And there was a break, a few hours. I let them, you know, whatever, someone wants to go shopping or take a dip in the Ganga, whatever you want to do. So I had a little time for myself and I was just walking and there was a moment where suddenly, I wasn't thinking about it, but that thought came up again. That you know, It's so amazing how all of this is a manifestation of that one divinity. You know, they say, Sarvam Shiva Mayam Jagat. It's all Shiva. And the moment that, that came and then I was looking around and you see maybe some, you know, some trash is lying there on the road, but that's also Shiva. You see one cow is coming. That is also Shiva in a different form. You see a guy selling something the same thing. And then even that trash, you're able to appreciate. And it's amazing how that one thing is manifesting in such a diversity. And that's beautiful. I want to say a few things. 
Firstly, I want to say that this is not a conversation for everyone. There's lots of people who've tuned out, yeah. and only for the ones meant to hear this, will the information truly sink into the mind. Uh, I remember once I was telling a friend of mine to read autobiography of a yogi, and she was a very fiery person, mm. you know, doing well in her career and uh, very headstrong. And I, I felt like she had a spiritual bent of mind, so I gave her the book. She started reading it. and then she put it down after a few mm-hmm. chapters so i asked her why did you put it down and she said that because in that book the writer has constantly referred to god as a he okay how does he know that god is mm-hmm. a he and i accepted that feedback i was like okay that's her conditioning that didn't even mm-hmm. strike me when i was reading yeah. the book i was just looking at god as a genderless yeah. being which you refer to as god i never thought about why i call it he or hmm. she calls it she etc uh eventually in life i realized that it's all our mental conditioning that stops us from exactly a- allowing the depths of what's being said to enter your mind which is why they say that when you read scriptures at different ages different aspects of those scriptures will enter your head because as you age you're letting go of your mental conditioning in many ways which is why the process, hopefully <laughs> that's how it should be yes for But- your one's own peace But you know, it's not even just the the spiritual knowledge entering you. If you really look at it, like I have a great love and passion for mantras from a very young age. But one of the most, I would say, beautiful things that mantras can do for you. Like I know you also love mantras, and you've spoken about. You had different people, wonderful people, come and share about mantras in the podcast. That it says in the scriptures manana trayate iti mantra the mantras are those sounds or vibrations that by repeating them they can take you beyond the mind they can transform your mind but why is it because this conditioning you know when we talk about karma you know it's a very abstract things for people maybe but these are the the seed impressions but then you say okay so from past lives or whatever you're take you've taken some of this conditioning with you but then how does that affect your life you go to an astrologer and say oh probably this is happening or that was happening or this will happen but how is that it doesn't you know it's very strange how can these impressions in your consciousness affect your life like that because that conditioning that we carry in the end that is the root cause for the thoughts coming up the qualities of the thoughts coming up so say you're a very intuitive person you're extremely smart and you're very blessed that out of 10 choices you will always make the best choice you know let's say you are like that now i give you 10 options you will choose the best one but if all 10 are different types of poison you will you will choose the best one but you still end up with poison and if someone is a total well forgive my language but an idiot like he's really not smart he's very unlucky he will always choose the worst option but if i give him 10 different types of cake nice pastry he will take the worst one but it's still nice pastry So if you look at your life anybody you know we act on our thoughts you get a thought and that is why you do an action now when you become more aware of course spiritual practices really help with that your awareness increases you start having a choice that okay do i want to act on this thought or not some people are on autopilot whatever thought comes they will do it then you become more aware and you say okay is this a good thought or not <laughs> is this something that i want like right now i feel like slapping this guy but i'm not going to do it because either i lose my job or it's not good or whatever i feel like eating 10 pizzas but i know it's not good let me not do it i may want to stay up all night binge watching this thing on netflix but i know i have to work tomorrow i have an important presentation so maybe only till 2 o'clock you know so you have a choice whether you do it or not but you still only have a choice between the thoughts that are coming up you know So somewhere there is something that has prompted you to say okay I want to become an engineer or I want to do a podcast or I want to do this or that and where are those thoughts coming from you cannot change a thought before it comes so if you really want to gain more freedom if you want to have better options then the maybe the really only and best way is to change the quality of your thoughts and that is where mantras come in because mantras can change the quality of your thoughts it can change it your conditioning and that is how say you know someone may have been doing a mantra for some time so suddenly they start getting different type of thoughts different quality thoughts so your options have improved so like i said even if you have 10 options and you choose the worst one if they're all good that'll take you in a good direction in life 
let me have a go at this for people who want to understand this with a little more depth okay i'm sure. trying to talk to my podcasting audience i have a friend of mine a mentor he's also created a lot of series on level super mind his name is om dhamatkar and i've learned a tremendous amount from him one of the earliest things he told me was that the process of meditation creates a larger distance between thought and perception so thought is the sentence that comes up oh i want to go to hmm. sleep oh i want to hit this guy oh i should be doing this in life you don't know where it's coming from perception is like another person inside your head who's looking at those thoughts and then acting upon them or judging them and figuring out what yeah. to do so when you're a child or when you're an animal there's no distance between the thoughts and the perception get a thought you act upon it yes tiger sees prey tiger jumps you know a child sees a toy tiger yeah. goes towards the toy uh and then as you grow older usually there's a little distance created where you're able to see your own thoughts yeah and then as you become more street smart probably that distance increases when you meditate the distance increases tremendously true when you uh, get into practices it increases even more but what i've never thought about until this conversation is about the origin points of those thoughts they're coming out of what in my head i visualized as some dark pit true coming out of somewhere and then that person in my head which i call perception looks at those thoughts exactly so you're saying that when you actually get into deeper practices that dark pit that those thoughts are coming out of actually becomes more fertile to throw up more interesting things at you yeah exactly and and it will help you burn the stuff that's not good for you you know like if we talk about spiritual practices you know you're being able to to burn some of the mantras even before they sprout you know the seeds before they sprout and that is how these practices are so valuable invaluable i would say and you know it's very interesting i've seen people sometimes you know they they say they come with a problem that they have they're having a health problem they've been to so many doctors and then you know they're just not able to figure out what's wrong with them and they tried so many things and then they went to a good astrologer jyotishi and they found out okay you know there are this is some part of your karma no you're facing but there is a remedy there is a mantra you can chant do this mantra it will help you now this person he was not into spiritual stuff at all but he was like you know i've tried everything i may as well give it a shot so it's not like he was sitting there with full devotion and but he did it every day now after one or two months this friend of mine the astrologer he called up this person and he asked him like how are you now he said actually i'm doing great <laughs> he said oh tell me what happened he said oh it's because not because of the mantra but you know what happened after two weeks after i spoke to you um a friend of mine said that he knows a, a good doctor and i thought okay i may as well go and see him and i met this person and he just saw me and he analyzed the the reports and then he he figured out exactly what was wrong and it was a very simple thing he gave me some uh, you know some what do you call it um Uh, some food supplements and things like that some some vitamins and my problem is gone now now what this person did not realize is that you know if we say okay there are certain mantra you can do as a remedy that doesn't mean you just do the mantra and your problem gets sorted what it does is that mantra will take away those karmas when done in the right way and when that karmic block is gone life will start flowing so The thing is for for 2 years he was meeting different doctors. Now why suddenly he came across this guy and that guy that doctor had the right thought at that moment where he saw this is your problem and he gave him the medicine. No. So that is why it's it's difficult for people to imagine but this conditioning not just in us but even in the world around us when you're able to change then suddenly it's like you know you you've done so many job interviews and suddenly you end up in the right place. or suddenly people will feel you are the right person you know so on a subtle level there's this whole thing going on and the spiritual practices like mantras which are very specific of course they have an impact on that level otherwise you can do all the effort you do but you know you you may be unlucky you may end up in the right place but you're just too late they just hired another guy for the position you know and that is why even if you see like in india of course still there is this practice uh, still many people do of namakarana you no know? like you you choose a name for the child not just because you like it or because it was your grandmother's name but they also they take the chart or they go to a pandit or an astrologer and then they will usually suggest you know okay you you start a name with this sound you no know? that is a common practice why because our name 
is like the first mantra diksha. It's the first mantra you receive because this is the, the thing that you keep thinking about. You keep Damn. telling people. People keep calling you that. So if that is chosen wisely, that can be tremendously beneficial because the right mantra, the right name, can make sure that you're not just healthy, but you are successful in society. People respect you. You know, your body is strong. And in ancient times, not even in India, even in other parts of the world as well, in many uh, cultures, there was this practice that if a child, when they're very young, keeps getting sick, you know, they have a lot of health problems, they would start questioning that maybe they were not given the right name. And sometimes they will change the name and you will see a drastic improvement. But the thing is, like with many of these practices now, like what you're also doing with the podcast is how do you make people aware of, of the quality stuff? Because meditation also... Every street corner now you can learn something doesn't mean it's really meditation. So with this Nama Karana, what I've seen is that usually what they do, they take the birth star, you know, like your Janma Nakshatra. And based on that, there are some letters. They say, okay, start your name with Va, V, Vu or something like that. That's what most people do because people ask me also, can you help me with a name? Or a Pandit suggested this, is it good? The thing is, if we look at those in ancient times also that had access to the top-notch astrologers, no? let's say we take Lord Rama. No, Sri Ram. Now, his name was given by the family guru, Vasishta himself, no? Brahma Rishi, grandfather of Parashara, one of the greatest Jyotishis. Now, Lord Rama's nakshatra was either Pusha or Punarvasu, and based on that, there are some letters that, that come. It's like Ka, ne, uh, Ko, Ke, and then Ha, He, Hu, like there's a bunch of them. Ra is not there. So that means they followed something different. They didn't follow this principle. No? And he was a great, he had so much knowledge of, of Jyotish and all of this knowledge. If we look at Sri Krishna, you know, his name was given by Gargamuni, again a great Rishi. Now his nakshatra was Rohini. Now there also the options are uh, Va, Vi, Vu, O. It's not R or Kr. So again, he followed something different. Jawaharlal Nehru, for example, his name was given by the Raj Jyotishi of Khetri, that plays there. So again, very knowledgeable person. For him also, a different thing was followed. So then if you go deeper into this, I've also started learning, it's very interesting. But then you see that they look at many other things. So if you just take that one letter based on the star, it means it will make your body strong and you'll have enough food to eat if you do it right. Doesn't mean you won't have health problems. This means you'll survive. Doesn't mean you'll have a good place in society. Doesn't mean you'll be happy necessarily. Doesn't mean you'll spiritually advance. They say if, if your name can be one of the names of your Ishtadevata, then nothing like it because that is the form of God or that universal consciousness that will take you towards mukti, towards liberation. It will take you out of bondage. So then whatever you do in life, at least you will not be going further into bondage. You'll be more free. You know? So these are things that when you think about it, it's, it's amazing. So that, that mantra, your name, if it is chosen correctly, that itself can be such a blessing. And in this, I'll not even say country, this subcontinent, no, this Bharat, they had this kind of knowledge with these sanskaras where they say, okay, at every important intersection of your life, you know, the, where there is a transformation, whether it's you getting a name, the first time you're eating the food, you know, anaprashan they call it, when you get married or when you start your education, if it's done in the right way, it can, they say it, it increases the sadak tattva, it will help you to progress further. It will support your journey and it will remove the badak tattva. It will remove the obstacles. And the goal was self-realization, freedom, full blossoming of the potential of human existence, of our consciousness. So when you consciously do those things, it makes all the difference. And that is also why I feel it's so beautiful that this knowledge is in many ways becoming a little more well-known now. There are so many people who want to know about it. Because it's not just for India. The whole world needs these things if people want to be happy, healthy, successful, and get along. You know? yeah. Swamiji, this was the end of the podcast. Uh, thank you. Great talking to you. Uh, I really needed to meet you today and hear what you had to say because I was feeling very uh, anxious, afraid. I've been thinking about not wishing for it. Again, I don't know where the thoughts are coming mm -hmm. from. But I've been thinking about an earlier peaceful death a lot. Mm. And I've been wondering why I've been thinking about an earlier peaceful death. Because in my head at one point, I thought I'd live till the age of 100 at least. 
and now i've started to visualize myself passing away at 37 or 38 but sometimes when i meet people like yourself i understand that visualization to probably be a passing away of a sense of ego and a sense of self and maybe transformation rather than just death which is always the motive behind any of these episodes we're trying to spread the message called transformation so thank you swami ji uh thank you for collaborating with us on level supermind like honor to be professionally collaborating with you mm-hmm. as well uh it's a lot of power that we put in each of those guided meditations uh so the fact that you put your own prana into that app means a lot to me that we've been able to kind of collaborate on some front i hope to speak to you again on the show and i hope that you had a fun time speaking to me <laughs> definitely and i wish you all the very best with this beautiful initiative and uh yeah it was uh sometimes deeper than i had anticipated in a in a good way and i hope it may help many people to explore a little further yeah what our true potential is yeah they say that if you take one step towards god or evolution then god or evolution takes 10 steps towards you definitely so it's just about moving in the direction of practice yes thank you thank you so much namaste Ladies and gentlemen that was the episode for today the dutch monk will be going through the comment section of this particular podcast so make sure you send in your questions your requests and your feedback for the next time that he's recording an episode of TRS with us shivas one of those infinitely deep topics that we can keep exploring that we can keep learning about together and the fact that i get this opportunity to ask my own questions to go about my own spiritual seeking in front of you all is one of the greatest privileges of my life this is something i can do forever i can't believe that i get to call this a profession so days like this are a little extra special for me a little extra enriching for me and a little extra wholesome for me i hope you feel the same emotions for all the spiritual episodes of TRS we're going to link our spiritual playlist down below Make sure you go check that out if you like today's episode and for more episodes just like this keep following the Ranveer show Ranveer and the team will be back very soon Om Namah Shivaya